An important conversation just moments away from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Futures negative six tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue happening right now. Talks between President Biden and President Xi. This is an opportunity for President Biden to assess uh, where President Xi stands. Uh, there's been, of course, rhetorical support or the absence of clear rhetoric and, and denunciation or the absence of denunciation by China of what Russia is doing. But the fact that China has not denounced what Russia is doing in an, and in and of itself speaks volumes. As U.S. fears grow, China may support Russia's invasion. Secretary Blinken delivering a warning. China will bear responsibility for any actions, actions it takes to support Russia's aggression, and we will not hesitate to impose costs. We believe China in particular has a responsibility to use its influence with President Putin and to defend the international rules and principles that it professes to support. The risk of escalation in Russia underlined by the Defense Intelligence Agency's new summary of worldwide threats, saying the following. As this war and its consequences slowly weaken Russia's conventional strength, Russia likely will increasingly rely on its nuclear deterrent to signal the West and project strength to its internal and external audiences. Team coverage starts right now with Anne-Marie here in New York City and Maria Tadeo in Brussels. AMH, let's start right here. That's the U.S. comment going into this conversation. What's the Chinese response? Well, China has really rebuted all of this, and they have said that, one, they were not aware, tactically aware, of the invasion before Russia decided to go into Ukraine. They've also said that they are against uh, what the United States is saying in terms of sanctions. They don't want to be stuck in the middle of the crossfires of the sanctions, and they also are the ones that have been, and we have seen them really amplifying some of this Russian disinformation. So they're going into this meeting where the United States does see China China potentially being able to move the needle, but a while at the same time, they haven't come out and condemned President Vladimir Putin. They haven't come down explicitly and supported him, but it does look like they are in the background giving a little bit more weight to President Vladimir Putin. And in this meeting, leader to leader, really the question going in is what role Xi Jinping and China can play. And the U.S. want them to try to bring Putin and his troops back from the brink. The question I have, Anne-Marie, this morning is what happened earlier this week. Seven hours of talks between the United States and China. It was Jake Sullivan and very little detail of what happened. Was it something that happened or something that did not happen? that prompted this meeting, this conversation? It's a great question. We know such little detail about this meeting. We know that from the U.S. side, they thought it was substantial, a substantial conversation. Uh, China, as well, had very similar rhetoric in their readout. But seven hours, you have to imagine, a number of issues were discussed. The United States is putting China on, on guard. One, do not let Russia skirt around the sanctions regimes that the United States and the West have put in place. And two, do not send weapons, including those very technical armed drones, to Russia. I imagine that was key in this discussion, and it's going to be key today when Biden sits down with Xi Jinping. We spent all morning having talks about talks. Maria Tadeo, Vladimir Putin had talks with Chancellor Schultz. Pretty clear who he thinks is to blame with the talks at the moment. Oh, yeah, he blames the Ukrainians, and he say the Ukrainians and, they, and what they put on the table is just unrealistic, and they need to get real. They need a reality check in terms of uh, a way forward that seems uh, diplomatic between the two sides. The problem is, of course, every story, you have to look at both the Ukrainians and the Russians. And when I spoke to a very close uh, member of the Zelensky government, a member of his cabinet who's very, very familiar with the talks, he told me the issue right now, of course, is that Russia has not ceased to open fire on Ukraine. And we have made it very clear. Ukraine is not going to give away everything for nothing. The first steps for serious talks is to engage on a ceasefire. That is not happening on the ground. It's 23 days uh, of war. The other thing that is becoming also very clear in these conversations that we're having with officials on the record but also behind the scenes is that Ukraine does not trust the Russian Federation and they do not trust Vladimir Putin. So they hint and signal that any peace deal going forward will have to have an international support. So that means perhaps the United States 
perhaps potentially the European Union, even Turkey. So these countries are going to get involved. What they made clear is that in their eyes, a bilateral deal between Ukraine and the Russian Federation will carry no weight. Maria, what can we achieve next week with the president flying into Brussels? Well, if you ask me, very, very little. A lot of this has to do with uh, showing not Ukraine, but the Eastern European countries, particularly, of, call, of course, the, the Baltics. This is about Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Romania, Poland, uh, all of those Eastern European countries that feel threatened by what they believe is an increasingly aggressive uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin. But when it comes to the actual war, when you speak to both the Russians and the Ukrainians, they make it clear this is a situation they have to fix themselves. This is a conversation that Russia and Ukraine Ukraine have to have. And in particular, when you speak to Ukrainians, they tell you this war is not going to end until Vladimir Putin and Volodymyr Zelensky meet in person. Maria, thank you. Joining us from Brussels, AMH here in New York City. She'll stay close through this hour. Joining us now, Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shannon, Economy's Peter Cheer, Colin Martin and Charles Schwab. Peace, straight to you. You said for the first time, peace talks seem credible. Why? They do seem to be making progress, partly because Putin is bogged down so badly. They you know, attacked on too many fronts. They didn't have enough resources. They're having problems with supply chain. So I think we went from a glimmer to realistic. But I would still say that's 50-50. He tends to use this tactic, right? He lulls people to a sense of you know, complacency and then pushes forward again. So I would call it a 50-50. We saw some real signals. The big problem seems to be coming down to really when we talk about neutrality, Ukraine is going to want some sort of security guarantee for that neutrality, right? They don't want to go disarm, have Russia rearm, and come right back in. So I think that's going to be a real catching point. They're both talking about neutrality, but I think they mean very different things. So there's a lot of sticking points. And ultimately, how China plays out is going to be huge. If China continues to tacitly support Russia, especially on the commodity side, this can drag on for much longer. According to CCTV, that call has started between President Xi and President Biden. Peter Chia, when you speak to the generals that work at Academy Securities, what are they saying to you right now about China's role in all of this? You know, I think the sense is that they have actually become the banker of Russia. They've become probably the banker of some of these other countries. And I do think, though, we would be, it would be a bit surprising if they stepped up and provided military support. That would maybe be a line too far. We also believe that they are probably telling Russia not to go nuclear or not to use biological weapons. So China is probably the, you know, acting as a bit of a governor on what Russia is doing, but they are going to provide the financing. And kind of as I look at that, and that translates to the macro side of things, I think China is aggressively talking to people about how they can start using the yuan versus the dollar. We're all kind of keeping a close eye on what's going on with their treasury holdings. Do they do something about that? Because when you look at China as a country, they've been hoarding natural resources to kind of make themselves sanction proof. So the treasury holdings would be the next step in that. Lisa Shallot, I know you're all focused on the second order effects. Any second order effects that haven't appeared in the system just yet that you think maybe we haven't fully discounted? Uh, well, I mean, that's a, um, a great question, Jonathan. You know, our sense is that, you know, we're at a place where, you know, we've talked about, you know, the changing regime uh, in terms of central bank policy. We've talked about maybe a new regime for inflation. And now I think we're in a new regime for um, geopolitics. And I think um, while we can certainly talk about, you know, some of the immediate tactical uh, things that will come out of negotiation for us, um, the much bigger narrative for for business cycle and markets to begin to think through um, is what how is this going to change spending in the West and the degree to which um, you know we're going to see a shift of investment priorities uh, at both a public and a private dimension in things like defense, uh, cyber, space, security public health, all of these dimensions in which this new, quote unquote, Cold War is going to be fought. Uh, and our sense is that not unlike, you know, the 1950s, you know, in post-World War II era, um, you know, we're going to see an explosion of, of capital investment across sectors um, that's going to drive productivity growth and, and in many ways, um, higher levels of economic growth in the West. Colin Martin, do you agree? Uh, we could see that. I mean, we, we have 
still easy financial, easy-ish financial conditions. And I think what we've seen, we're still coming out of you know an emergency period uh, post-pandemic where there were a lot of concerns about you know onshoring activity, bringing manufacturing here, maybe diversifying production, things like that. And now with the situation in Russia and Ukraine, you could see a lot of corporations um, exploring a lot of avenues. But what we're focused on right now are just what are the risks out there and what, what does this all have to do with growth? Um, when, we, when we go back to the, to the discussions with China, I think this is important. I'm, I'm far from a geopolitical expert on Russia or China relations, um, but their involvement will play a role in this in terms of how long this conflict lasts. And if it does continue to prolong, that's just an uncertainty uh, that the markets won't like. We've we've gotten some good news lately. We've seen risk assets bounce back sharply this week, um, not just in the equity markets, but we've seen a, a strong bounce back in the credit markets as well. But there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. So what we're telling our clients at Schwab is kind of more of a neutral outlook. We don't really have too many tactical ideas out there. We're kind of playing defense until some of the things settle. We're going to build on the market implications through the program, throw in a little bit of Fed speak as well. We'll get to that in just a moment. You guys are going to be sticking with me, Lisa, Peter and Colin. I want to get you some movers ahead of the opening bound, 20 minutes away. Here's Abby. John, well, after three big updates for the S&P 500, in fact, the best three days since November of 2020, with that index gaining 5.7%, we have a bit of weakness, and it's broad-based, too. Apple falling about six-tenths of 1%, seven-tenths of 1% at this point, down a little bit more than it had been earlier. Banks are lower with yields lower. FedEx down 2.5%. 4%. They put up an earnings miss on higher labor costs and worker shortages at distribution centers. And then GameStop down 9.5%. They posted a surprise loss. This stock has fallen 23 of the last 28 quarters. So if that loss holds today or any loss holds, it would be consistent with what has happened with many of their earnings releases recently, John. Abby, thank you. Coming up on the program, attacks continue and talks drag on. The talks continue. Uh, unfortunately, the progress is not that fast as uh, one could have expected. Any talks uh, ideally should take place in the uh, terms of ceasefire, which is not the case uh, currently. And somehow central bankers have got to make a big call for the year ahead. That's next. If you have the serious diplomatic talks, you, you, you immediately implement the ceasefire. Uh, just to remind you, when they started the first round of negotiations to, on the level of delegations, they promised to have a ceasefire, which was not the case during the first, second, third, and already fourth round of negotiations. Yes, ceasefire should be implemented immediately. The turmoil around this story clearly fueling uncertainty around the Fed's next move. Investors gearing up for a busy week of Fed speak with Chair Powell, Governor Waller, President Williams and Bullard all on deck. Mike McKee, we've heard from Waller and Bullard already, and we know what camp they're in. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, James Bullard was, of course, the one who dissented at the last meeting. Chris Waller went into the meeting saying he thought Jim Bullard was right about going 50 basis points, but he did not dissent. Talk about that in just a second, but I want to show you uh, one of the reasons why we're going to get this kind of Fed speak. You take a look at the dot plot and go over to the far left there, and you see uh, the dot at the top. That's obviously Jim Bullard, given his comments today. But who's the one all the way at the bottom? Look how far below that is. That's 1.3 percent at the bottom dot. And the top dot, Bullard, is over 3 percent. There's a lot of disagreement on the Fed. There's a disagreement in the market because you take a look at the chart there and the light green is uh, below the Fed, that's the market view on where rates should be. So the market thinks rates should be a little higher than the Fed this year, but uh, they think it, uh, the Fed's going too far. So how do they uh, forecast this? Well, Bullard out this morning explaining himself, saying he recommended that they try to achieve a level of the policy rate above 3 percent to quickly adjust the policy rate to a more appropriate level for the current circumstances. But what are the current circumstances? We've had notes out this morning from economists, including our old friend John Sylvia, who said the market may be discounting or missing the idea that the economy could slow significantly because of the war and because COVID is still around. 
Next week, as you mentioned, an awful lot of people speaking. We heard, as you said, from uh, Chris Waller today. We're also going to hear from Mickey Bowman, Neil Kashkari. Uh, and then on Monday, uh, the big day, Rafael Bostic and Jay Powell at the NABE meeting in Washington. We'll get a good explanation from Jay Powell maybe on uh, what he thinks should be done. And then we'll hear... As you mentioned, from Jim Bullard, live here on Bloomberg Television on Tuesday, and Mary Daly from San Francisco, who will be on with us live on Wednesday. Now, the interesting thing there is they're on uh, two different ends of the spectrum, or at least they were going into the meeting. We'll see if anybody's minds have been changed. Mike McKee, what a conversation coming up next week. Don't you miss John Sylvia? I do. Fantastic yeah. guy. Former chief economist over at Wales. Mike, thank you. This is a story right now. Can we get that dot plot in the control room? Can you bring that dot plot up again that Mike just used? And we'll get to that spread at the front end for 2022. And look at those two dots at either end. The range of outcomes here. I mean, we talk about the median dot all the time. But there's Bullard up top, north of 3%. And as Mike pointed out, there's a dot sub 150. Lisa Shannon, the range of outcomes here for the year ahead is really, really wide. How on earth do you make a call around a story like this? I, I think it's it's very hard, and I think it's one of the reasons why you know both stock and bond markets uh, are struggling so much. I think um, you know that coming into this period of time, uh, as we know, there were you know folks who had bought into this view uh, of secular stagnation or this belief that you know interest rates uh, are stuck lower for longer forever, and that the Fed's never going to be able to get. Uh, out of its own way because the, the growth in the economy is just too low and deflationary forces are just too strong. Uh, and then, you know, you've had other folks like, like Morgan Stanley who've said, no, no, this is going to be a different business cycle and we're going to break out uh, and growth and inflation are going to be, you know, much higher because structural uh, dimensions and structural factors are changing and and you know we're more in the in the bullard camp uh, i think that you know one of the things that has been difficult for the fed and you know it's hard for for them to admit it is they keep talking about how they're data driven uh, but as we know back in august of 2020 they articulated a policy framework of average inflation targeting around two percent and maximum employment um, that had absolutely no time or dimension attached to them. So I think that, you know, the Fed governors are looking at data, but they don't know how to calibrate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's why we're getting this spread of outcomes now uh, that we're seeing in these dot plots, because as much as, uh, you know, Jay Powell has been good at, at being a good communicator to the street of late, uh, I'm not entirely sure that that he's been good at corralling all the governors around a true data driven analytical framework. Well, clearly, Governor Waller disagrees, given the comments out on CNBC earlier this morning. Let's take the Morgan Stanley view. It's one view we can build on it. Here's the Morgan Stanley view. This time we think peak rates will likely be higher, higher inflation, stronger growth should allow for a higher peak and a longer hiking cycle. Now, Colin Martin, that's one way of looking at this. Governor Warner would like rates higher. Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed would like to see a rate maybe above 2, perhaps even above 3% by year end, never mind next year. Which camp are you in? You know, I think we're, we're lower than, than both of them right now. You know, when you, when you consider uh, Bullard's comments and his projection, I mean, one, one, we know that. He's been very vocal, and we saw the dot the other day above 3%. There's a lot of talk about a hard landing versus a soft landing. I think if they were to hike as aggressively as Jim Bullard would prefer, uh, we'd likely get that hard landing, unfortunately. Um, you know, I mentioned this before, but, but a lot of it does come down to, to, to the murky outlook uh, with Russia and Ukraine. What we do know is that leading up to this situation, the economy was strong. Waller commented on that uh, this morning where he said, you know, a, a 50 basis, I think he said it was a screaming opportunity to hike uh, by 50 basis points because uh, the economic outlook was strong. And, and Powell's been talking about that as well. Even though he's been, been dovish in the past, he's pretty bullish on the economy based on his public comments. He seems to be very bullish on the labor market. And, and he does seem to think that the economy can withstand uh, an aggressive pace of rate hikes. When we look at what, what the projections gave us this week, they gave us what the market wanted. The market was pricing in seven hikes. 
the dots indicated that, and then the market repriced even higher, expecting more. Um, but again, I do think it does come down to the situation uh, overseas. If we get some good news there, uh, and growth continues to come in just as expected, which was, you know, uh, relatively strong, maybe down from last year. That gives the Fed the runway to get to that seven hikes this year. But we do think uh, a lot of it does depend on that. And, and we have to evaluate the data as it comes in. I mean, I think they're going to be pretty uh, open uh, with whether they need to be aggressive and actually get that 50 basis point hike or if they come in below the seven that the markets are pricing in. We're evaluating the Fed speak right now. It's kicking two-year yield tight by three basis points to about 195. Lisa, you're not expecting a recession. You've got faith in the strength of this labor market. Does that translate into a more constructive view on stocks? Uh, so not yet. Uh, and, you know, and our view here has been, you know, somewhat nuanced. But, um, you know, our sense is that the, the stock market is still assuming uh, that, you know, we're going to be able to make the, the sales and the earnings um, estimates that are out there. And we're just getting increasingly concerned uh, that those expectations for companies as opposed to the economy, and this is really important, um, we often have to spend time with clients reminding them that the aggregate economy is not the same as the market. The market today uh, is comprised of, of uh, you know, uh, multinational tech heavy, uh, which make up the largest market cap of the indexes. Uh, and our contention has been uh, that while the economy might be terrific, the headwinds for some of these companies uh, still needs to be discounted. So we're not jumping in with both feet, um, certainly in the passive indices, uh, because we think that, that investors need to appreciate that there's been a pull forward in demand and that inflation is going to hit uh, profit margins uh, to a degree not currently discounted. Lisa Shallop will be sticking with us alongside Colin Martin, and hopefully we can reestablish the connection with Peter Cheer and get him back as well. Coming up the morning calls and later, the rotation back into big tech. Can this year's biggest laggard stage a big comeback? Their conversation just around a corner from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bound equity futures, just a little bit softer, down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. Yields at the front end a little bit higher. Take a look at twos, tens, and thirties. Twos on Wednesday, just short of two percent at about one ninety nine. Right now, one ninety five eighty nine. Just a bit of hawkish Fed speed, kicking yields just a little bit higher on twos. That's the price action. Let's get you the trading diary and some morning calls. Not the trading diary. Let's get to Mizuo, upgrading target resources to a buy, raising its price target from 58 to 85, highlighting the firm's fundamentals that are too strong to ignore. Wedbush cutting its price target for GameStop to 30. Michael Pack denoting the company's cash balance may erode relatively quickly. And finally, Raymond James upgrading all state to a strong buy, 165 price target, highlighting the company's opportunity for valuation re-rating over the next 18 months. Up next, growth stocks showing signs of life after reassurances from China and the Fed. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bound this Friday morning. Good morning to you all. Coming into Friday after the close on Thursday, this equity market poised for the biggest weekly gain of the year so far on the S&P, up by almost five percent. We retreat, we pull back about a third of one percent. That's the opening bound. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. This yield curve's flatter. The front end yields are higher. The back end tens unchanged at one sixteen fifty-five. Twos are up by almost five basis points now to 196. And the spread between twos and tens, just short of 21 basis points. Let's call it 20 as we get some hawkish Fed speak from Governor Waller and President Bullard. Euro dollar threatening to break 110 all over again. 110 flat at the moment and negative eight tenths of 1% in that currency pair. So we're starting to see a bit of dollar strength and crude higher just by 1.26% to 104.28. About 30 seconds into the session with your stock movers, 
Here's Abby. John, well, it has been a big up week so far this week. We're looking at one of the best weeks in a while, the first up week, I should say, in three weeks. But we are taking a little bit of a cooling off this morning, as you suggested. Tech, one of the worst sectors. NVIDIA, not surprisingly, the big chip maker is down about three tenths of one percent, but well off of its pre-market low. So maybe the bulls are going to try to pull through on this triple witching day. Tesla also reversing a pre-market loss, now just basically fluctuating. Firmly to the downside, though, the travel trade, Carnival, down 1.3 percent in fact. FedEx below its pre-market lows, now down 4.4 percent. This, of course, as they missed, investors not liking that. It's going to be very interesting to see how this day plays out, John. Abby, thanks for that. And pleased to say that we've established a connection with Peter Chir of Academy Securities. We've had to do that over the phone. So, Pete, I didn't want to go into the weekend without getting your thoughts on the broader market, because I know you are slightly constructive here, even with everything else going on. So run us through it point by point. So, yeah, it had been constructive. I think a lot had been priced in. We were getting kind of these good news coming out of Russian Ukraine talks. We dealt with the Fed. I think the Fed really did deliver kind of this very slow but steady pace of hikes that the market seemed to be able to absorb. But I think I would take risk off into this weekend. I think there's too much risk right now that China continues to kind of aid and abet Russia, and that's going to be problematic for markets. I think you're going to see pullback and so I'm a little bit cautious right now I keep thinking that we're seeing kind of the world realign where you have these commodity rich countries that don't necessarily have the same politics as us that are going to start aligning themselves more and more with China we're going to have to go to countries that are closer to us and by closer I either mean in political values or proximity so I think we're at this risk of separation maybe we'll get the all clear signal after this 9 a.m. call but if we don't I think you want to pull back take some gains on the recent bounce and be cautious that's the broader risk story P I know you had some big themes coming into this year and last year for that matter as well. Does this scenario accelerate some of those themes and how would you express that in markets at the moment? Yeah, so I really think it does. I continue to avoid China. I think China is just separating from the world. They're delinking. I love Latin American stocks. I think we're going to see Canada, Mexico, Latin America benefit from this reshift in global supply chains, how we're going to work on that. And I continue to love the oil services space, the oil exploration. I think we are going to have to look at everything through a national security lens, and that is going to make sure that we have a lot more resources that are either in our direct control or with places that we trust, um, again, both by political alliances or proximity. So that to me is oil, energy, commodities, anything like that I think will do very, very well. And I really want to embrace Latin America and I still want to avoid China. Can we talk about the permanency of this, Pete? Blue Bay said something really phenomenal in the last couple of days. They said, we think Russia will be in the isolated wilderness for a long time to come. And this is what they said after that line. A regime change in Russia is probably a prerequisite for reinvestment for many. Now, Pete, if China got involved in this in a way that the United States would not like, are they part of that story too? Yes. So I think I completely agree with them that people are not going to be in a rush to go back to Russia. And already, I think if you go back three years ago, even before the trade war and during the trade war, I think c companies were already questioning what the relationship was with China. How much information, how much IP was being taken away? Was the business opportunity ever that great? And this is just going to accelerate that. And people have to realistically look at this. Again, I keep bringing back, China's been accumulating natural resources to kind of make themselves sanction-proof. So I think we've got to be well aware of this. And when we start thinking about the supply chain and the cost of goods that we are purchasing, I think you have to start really accounting for that risk of geopolitical, that something yeah. happens where you get cut off or it becomes impossible to ship. So I think that's going to drive the economic decision to reshore, bring things closer. Pete, as far as we're aware, this call between the President of the United States and the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, President Xi, is happening right now. Now, for people who aren't familiar with your firm, Academy Securities, a large proportion of that is made up of veterans, including a group of generals that I know you rely on around the Investment Committee. Now, I just wonder from your perspective, as you start to assess the risk that China does actually support Russia militarily, I wonder what you look for to identify the risk and what the generals are telling you at the moment, Pete. Can you share some of that with us? Yeah, so I think one of our generals, General Robert Walsh, he was really instrumental in naming China as a strategic competitor. And that was three years ago under the Trump administration. If anything, I think we are seeing that there's more and more friction and China has more and more of a willingness to be inward looking and is shutting down. 
And I don't think we see military support. I think it's going to be easier for them to do the financial support, which actually that dovetails very nicely into the macro work we've been doing, where you've seen China for years push their percentage in the SDR, working on including their bonds and all these bond indices, knowing how important passive investing is in the bond world. You know, they're establishing the digital wand for control. So they have been looking at upping the ante in terms of getting people to trade commodity futures in their currency. I think this is just going to be extending that. So you're seeing China always on these multiple fronts, what they're doing militarily, what they're doing other ways. I do think that when we talk to our generals, we think Taiwan is not going to be on the table. I think China is not going to attack militarily. There's so many reasons how Taiwan has changed the defense. I think they're seeing what's going on in Russia. Yeah. So that, I think, is very good. On the other side of it, I think Taiwan's importance to China is going to diminish over time as semiconductor factories get built across the globe. Pete, great work as always, buddy. And sorry about the connection. Peter Chia there of Academy Securities. We're about six minutes into this. We're down about two-tenths of 1% on the S&P on the NASDAQ. We're also down about two-tenths of 1%. The team here at Bloomberg reporting the following just moments ago. I wanted to share it with you. Russian cyber attacks have so far struggled to successfully target Ukraine's critical national infrastructure. That according to government officials, just some reporting we've done in the last couple of moments that I wanted to share with you. For the broader market, you've seen the story, the year's biggest laggards trying to make a big comeback. Chairman Powell giving the beaten down tech names a boost after seemingly ripping off the band-aid. Weighing in on this is Katie Lines. Well, John, some nascent signs of life is what I would call this, because over the last three days coming into today, yes, you did have those growth names outperforming. The S&P 500, of course, up about 5.7% over that time. Value was the laggard here, up just 3.9%, while its growth counterpart up nearly eight percentage points. And of course, for the tech heavy NASDAQ 100, the SOX index of semiconductors, the outperformance has been even larger. On the week so far, growth has actually outperformed value by the widest margin going back to November of last year. And in three of the last seven sessions, that daily margin of outperformance has been greater than one and a half percentage points. What's interesting is that we have also seen bond yields moving higher largely over that time. Well, at the start of last week, the 10 year was at 177. Today, we're in and around 216. And usually those higher yields would be putting pressure on stocks that command higher multiples. That, to be fair, though, has weighed heavily on these stocks really since the start of the year. So with that caveat, the rebound of the last few days only go so far to cover the ground uh, that have, these stocks have lost this year. Collectively, the largest tech companies have lost $1.5 trillion in market cap so far in 2020 for names like Apple and Microsoft, or 2022, excuse me. That market cap loss has been $300 billion plus. Ridiculously large numbers. Kelly Lines, thank you. Bigger than some stock markets in Europe. Kelly, thank you very much. Here's the take from Credit Suisse. This is their quote. The positive market reaction to the FOMC's deliberation suggests that the markets have had enough time to digest the changed economic outlook. We note that glimmers of hope have surfaced. Lisa Shallot, I want to pick up on that line that the Fed ripped the Band-Aid off and they can lean back into the beaten up tech sectors. When I go through the big winners for you, focus on financials, energy, industrials, healthcare, and services. Where do those big tech names fit in? Uh, from our perspective, they really don't yet. Well, certainly we've been, uh, you know, advocates of active stock picking where you've got some, uh, you know, quality cash flows at, at you know, growth at a reasonable price. Um, we're not ready to go uh, back headlong into, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, high flying consumer discretionary comm services or, or, you know, mega cap tech names um, quite yet. Um, I think the bounce that we're seeing is a very reflexive by the dip kind of bounce. Uh, I think that the idea uh, that, you know, the Fed has done its job, delivered as advertised and, you know, all is well um, is, um, I think, premature uh, to call the all clear. I think, you know, one of the, the, you know, most important but perhaps least analyzed dimension of the Fed statement uh, this week was the discussion about the fact that, you know, we're probably going to get balance sheet action, uh, you know, starting in May, or at least an articulation of the plan around quantitative tightening. Now, just to put things in perspective, remember, uh, you know, back in, in 2017 to, to 2018, uh, you know, the Fed began a, a program of quantitative tightening. Back then, uh, they were able to to take you know roughly 700 uh, billion dollars off off the balance sheet, and that you know kind of tanked markets, if folks remember, and and caused the Fed to have to reverse course. 
Um, our guess is that we're going to start reducing balance sheet, uh, you know, in, in the second half of this year and may try to take half a trillion dollars out at, at a rate of, of 80 billion uh, per month. Um, so that's a long way of me saying, I, I think it's still to be determined how we're going to go uh, through a, a period of very rapid rate hikes, six or seven more this year, plus quantitative tightening, and what that really means for markets and what it really means for the economy. I don't think any of us really know. How can you fully price something if you don't fully understand it? And Colin Martin, I don't think we've got a decent idea of the size of the balance sheet removal, reduction, and ultimately what impact that's going to have on this market. Colin, I was surprised we didn't get many questions on it in the news conference. I think we got a couple. And when they were asked, Chairman Powell was open to talk about it. He said, look to the minutes. And Colin, it just reminded me, and I've talked about this repeatedly since Wednesday, of the December Fed meeting. When you had this news conference, Chairman Powell told you everything. And then for some reason, we didn't trade on it until we got the minutes. Are we going to repeat that, Colin? I hope not. I can't remember the last time uh, Powell told us to specifically look to the minutes. So, so now I really can't wait till they get released so that we can get some details. The fact that the statement offered zero, except that that we'll get details at a coming meeting, um, but leads me to believe that that we will get some details. I'm sure it was a spirited discussion, but I would expect some sort of announcement soon. One, we're, one way we're looking at it, though, is once they do embark on QT, and regardless of how quickly they begin to shrink their balance, balance sheet, that's a form of tightening in and of itself. So, so that's one of the reasons why going into this week, we, we've been less aggressive in terms of, of, of how many times the Fed can hike this year. And right now, that they're telling us they will, but, but we're paying a very close attention to the Fed's balance sheet, how quickly they shrink it, and what effect it has on financial conditions. Because if it does tighten financial conditions too much in addition to the rate hikes, um, th then we can see some, some downside risks uh, bubble up. Colin Martin, Lisa Shallot, to both of you, have a great weekend and thanks for being with us through the opening bell. This is a tough moment for this Fed and for this chairman too. When you go into the news conference, you have to somehow reflect the consensus on the committee. What if it's really difficult to form a consensus? And already what we're seeing in the early Fed speak is that you've got Jim Bullard who wants rates up aggressively. You've got a governor of the Fed who basically wanted a 50 basis point hike. And for whatever reason, governors don't dissent. So he did not dissent. I wonder how wide the range of views is on the committee right now and how that dances when we get the FOMC minutes. What would that be a platform for? The Hawks to sound a little bit louder, maybe. Coming up, the US warning that Russia could escalate attacks. We believe that Moscow may be setting the stage to use a chemical weapon and then falsely blame Ukraine to justify escalating its attacks on the Ukrainian people. That conversation's coming up, just getting a headline that Russia transferred US dollars to settle its Euro bond coupons. That drop in just seconds ago. We're going to build on that in just a second. I have not seen uh, any meaningful efforts by Russia to bring this war that it's perpetrating to a conclusion through uh, diplomacy. We believe that Moscow may be setting the stage to use a chemical weapon and then falsely blame Ukraine to justify escalating its attacks on the Ukrainian people. The situation still volatile. S&P ratings downgrading Russia's credit score and signaling more potential cuts to come. They said the following. If funds are not accessible for investors or if a payment is made in a currency not stipulated in the terms of the obligation and we believe that the investor does not agree to the alternative payment, we could deem this a default. What is a default? What isn't a default? What we understand at the moment is the following. I want to share this breaking news with you from the team down in Washington. Russia has transferred US dollars to settle coupon payments due back on Wednesday on two euro bonds. You remember the amount? $117 million. This according to people familiar with the matter. The story goes on to read, the people declined to be identified because they aren't authorized to speak publicly on the issue. A Treasury spokeswoman said US sanctions on Russia don't prohibit Russia from making these debt payments, mirroring a statement similar to the one that we got on Wednesday. I want to bring in Damien Sassar of Bloomberg Intelligence on this story. Damien, figuring this out, 
piece by piece, it's really difficult. I know you spent a lot of time on it Wednesday, Thursday, again this morning. Run us through what's been happening here, where we've had difficulties, and what it might mean for future payments. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so basically the $117 million, from what I understand, J.P. Morgan would have never sent those funds onto Citigroup if the U.S. Treasury had not authorized it to do so. So it seems to me that the U.S. government is fine allowing Russia to pay from non-sanctioned accounts to its foreign creditors. So it's not going to block that payment. It looks like Russia is fulfilling that payment, and those monies will hit the accounts today. I think the real question, Jonathan, that we need to ask is, why on earth would Russia pay U.S. dollar creditors coupon when it's trying to wage this war in Ukraine and its economy is suffering so very badly? So the answer, really, there's three cases. There's the uh, the conspiracy theorists who think that those bonds are owned by Russians, which I... I applied little faith to. There's the optimist that said, look at the timing yesterday. We were perhaps in a de-escalation, and Russia said, you know, maybe we'll buy some time here because we want to avoid default. I put little faith in that also. For me, I'm taking the pragmatist argument, the fact that if you look back to July of 2019, when Crystal X pierced the veil of sovereign immunity for the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, basically, the Supreme Court upheld a, uh, the, the, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, allowing private creditors to go after offshore assets held by not just the sovereign, but a quasi-sovereign entity, in this case, Petaveza's Sitco refining assets. And creditors will aggressively go after Russian assets offshore if the default actually is triggered. And so I think Putin's trying to buy himself a little bit of time because the last thing he needs on his desk right now are creditors accelerating the process against all Russian assets lo located offshore. So, Damien, two things. Whenever you assess these things, I'll try and make them really simple. You have to assess ability to pay, yes. willingness to pay. What we've demonstrated this week is willingness. Future ability, I think, is still a question mark. Because the first thing I was thinking of is where did the dollars come from? Clearly not sanctioned accounts. Maybe that would be a conspiracy theory, so to speak, because I've got no idea. But clearly, for some people, that's not where it came from. So my question would be, Damien, if they've met this payment, do they have the money to meet future payments? So, yeah, an answer to that is I do believe they have plenty of money that they can lean into and money that is non-sanctioned at this point. The, the reality is, though, um, you know, I, 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 they have the willingness to pay, they have the capacity to pay, but if they are physically unable to pay, S&P and Fitch have already said that will constitute a default. If the monies don't arrive in the creditors' accounts, that is a default. So really, at the end of the day, Jonathan, what you're saying and what you're hitting on here is the U.S. Treasury can actually force Russia into a default if it chooses not to approve the money transfers. And that is exactly where we are today. It's a very slippery slope. And that point's the point I want to build on, because S&P lent on this. They were a little bit more subtle about it. They said if the funds are not accessible for investors, isn't that another way of saying, even if sanctions stop the pipes from working, even if you try and send it, it does not reach the end investor, we're calling that a default? Absolutely. The sanctions are of Russia's own making. And so the, the rating agencies are going to constitute it a default if, you know, they just can't move the money across borders and get it to the creditors that are owed it. And so that is really where we are. It's an unprecedented time, Jonathan. Capacity and willingness to pay, but still may go into default because they're just unable to pay. We're learning things about the sovereign and how these payments will be made, how we'll process them through U.S. banks. That's one thing. The second point for me is the corporate story. Damien, is there a different thing happening here, what we've seen from the sovereign and what we've seen from corporations? So corporations are in a very, very different... Uh, they, they, yeah, so they basically can't really um, make payment. You've seen Yandex trying to approach creditors to restructure. In fact, in ServiceDoll's case, they're saying that the U.S. government may not, for whatever reason, allow them to make payment, maybe because the cash is held in a blocked account. So there's a lot of piping and logistics to go through, but it seems to me that OFAC and the U.S. Treasury are firmly on top of this and talking very, very closely with J.P. Morgan and Citigroup, you know, in order to ensure that whatever monies are paid, they're not monies that have been sanctioned, that are held in, as war repatriations for the people of Ukraine and for the rebuilding of that country when and if this all ends. Is there anything about this story that gives you confidence about this asset class, this world, Russia, or anything attached to it? You know, I mean, you know, Jay Newman, uh, uh, former Elliot, pointed out yesterday that this could be the beginning of a 1980s-style wave of sovereign defaults. And that's for a very different reason, not tied to what's going on here in Russia. If that does indeed occur, it's because these economies are weak and they've gone into, uh, they, they have huge debt levels that, quite frankly, I don't see how they're going to pay it off. So, you know, they're going to keep pushing the can down the road, but eventually the rubber is going to meet the road and in a rising rate environment where financial conditions are tightening, the real risk here is that you're going to see a wave of sovereign defaults along the periphery in... Uh, uh, EM. And, you know, I, I, I don't personally call that my base case, but yeah, it's certainly a risk. And I, I, I mean, it's a possibility. Damien, this was perfect timing, sir. And thank you for the hard work.
to help me understand, all of us understand, what on earth is going on with this story. Damien Sasse there of Bloomberg Intelligence. According to the team down in D.C., according to people familiar with the matter, Russia has transferred U.S. dollars to settle coupon payments due back on Wednesday on two euro bonds. Coming up, finally, we'll get to the training diary and get you to the weekend. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. So we are 26 minutes in. Equities are basically dead flat on the Nasdaq, down about two tenths of 1% on the S&P, but some fascinating things are happening in the bond market. Switch up the board and get to treasuries. Threes aren't on here, but we're starting to see the curve slowly invert. Sevens above tens, fives above tens, threes above tens, two-year yields just short of that, 195. A break of 20 basis points, the spread between twos and tens. That's the story in the bond market. So if you've got a constructive view on equities right now, look to bonds and maybe ask yourself whether you can tolerate what's going on at the moment. As the price action, your trading diary looks like this. The Fed speak from Barkin, Bauman later. The Fed speak continues into next week with Chairman Powell and Bostick on Monday. Williams, Daily Mester all on deck on Tuesday. We'll hear from ECB President Christine Lagarde and get some data in the mix as well. From New York City, this was the countdown to the open. Enjoy the weekend. This is Bloomberg.